Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Ellensburg, Washington, USA. The local time is 8.48 a.m. And in 12 minutes or so, we will begin our discussion this morning of Mima Mounds. 12 minutes from now, at the top of the hour. I'm a little scrambled. Hang on, I gotta set up a couple more things. Beautiful morning here. How's everything going there? Good morning, Patrick, Julie. Anna Calrica, hello, good morning, good afternoon. Bonnie, Scotland, hello from the UK. Love to see those distant places with us this morning. That's the whole reason for this Weekend morning session, Rotterdam, Holland. Good morning. I'm really just kind of cherry picking the uh, the European, uh, Japan, any any distant places. Barcelona. Good morning. Yelm. Ooh, talking about close to home here this morning, Jason. Tohoku. Good morning, Blue Forest Roads. You've been a regular with us. So no offense to the North Americans, I'm glad that you're with us, but uh, Maldives, oh my lord. <coughs> um, it's a uh, good morning from Finland, uh, Peto, 222. Two, two. Good morning. Uh, it's in uh, Aberdeen, Scotland, good morning. Uh, it's, it's an idyllic morning here. I realize in the eastern part of the US it's uh, snowing or whatever. <laughs> in mid-May, uh, but here uh, could not be better. So I'm, I'm glad that we're back outside. Uh, ladders everywhere, all sorts of painting equipment, mostly hidden, I think, behind the chalkboard. Uh, but I asked the guys, Luxembourg, good morning. I, uh, Jurassic Coast, UK, oh, the, uh, Dubai. Oh, good Lord, this is exciting. Um, I asked the guys if they would mind cleaning up this area because they're taking the weekend off. Belgium, good morning. The People's Republic of Western Washington, good one, Dale. So, um, it feels great to be back outside and the weather looks good for both uh, this morning and tomorrow morning. Uh, Yorkshire, Toronto, wonderful. Let's look at tomorrow's schedule. I, I don't even know if I need to show it, but I guess I feel better if I do. <clears throat> this is the week that was. We were uh, mostly in eastern Washington uh, this week, talking about the Ice Age, talking about the Ice Age floods. This is past now, uh, but all these shows are available to watch <clears throat> in replay form, including the live comments, and there's a bunch of other comments down below. Uh, so... If you missed a few of those and want to get caught up on what we're doing, that's great. You don't have to, obviously. Uh, but this weekend, uh, we're in Puget Lowland. We're in Western Washington firmly, both today and tomorrow. <clears throat> and you'll see we'll, we'll have reason to leave Western Washington both this morning and tomorrow morning. But for the most part, our discussion will be um, anchored with the Mima Mounds this morning uh, near Olympia, Washington, and then... Puget Sound and talk of tsunami deposits. Oh, we have a friend this morning. Hey, would you like to come over quick? What do you think? The painters aren't here. You don't have to be nervous now. Let's say hi to these guys. Let's say hi to these guys. Yeah. 
Oh, so this is Bijou, and he is uh, happy that he doesn't have to be nervous this morning. The painters, who are wonderful fellows and have been working extremely hard, Alex and his three boys, um, are not here today and tomorrow. So this guy can go back to business as normal, uh, at least for the next couple of days. Isn't that right? You got friends you want to go visit with, or did you want to did you want to say hi to these guys? Did you want to say hi? No. Okay. Um, so I assume our visuals are okay and our audio is okay. Um, I think I've given up being paranoid about it because it's been working more or less, even on the weekends now. And uh, Liz is inside using the wireless, but that doesn't seem to be an issue. Good, 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 good. Okay, see you later. I suppose you're going to be uh, wanting to get back inside at 10 o'clock. I'll have to remember that. Terrific. <clears throat> How about a few more uh, hellos to people this morning, and then I'll start thinking seriously about what we're up to this morning. Yeah, Jackie, I had to Google 5x5, five five too. It's some, I think it's a military thing saying everything's all clear or all good or something like that. Hermiston, oh, what the heck, we'll shout out some of the Western North America people. Jasper, Georgia. Uh, Kathy in Australia, of course. Thank you, Kathy, for all of your interests. Uh, Shawila, Evelyn, good morning. Newcastle, Australia. Livermore, Maltby, I'll have to Google that one. Maltby, Washington. London, Canada. New Orleans. Ground Mound, Washington. It's got a nice ring to it. Another UK, another Netherlands. Dick, hello. Queens, New York. All right, always fun to see these places and uh, I enjoy Anchorage, good morning. I enjoy uh, watching the replays and seeing all these comments and um, I see every last comment. And it's always a pleasant thing. Kind of self-indulgent, I must say, but I'm mostly looking at the comments. I'm not really looking at me, I promise. Italy's here with us this morning. Good. Oh, be, well, Bijou's... Bijou's interested in the uh, prop this morning, which I'm not even really going to use as a prop for teaching, but I am going to use it a little bit. A beautiful croissant from Vindman's Bakery. Why not? Go for it, man. Go for it. You want to eat some of it? That's fine. I don't know. Croissants are uh, they're healthy for cats, right? A lot of advice from some of you, by the way. <laughs> Lifestyle advice. <laughs> Dandelions and hair on the neck. And... Hey, man. Whatever, whatever fuels you, go for it. Yeah, a couple minutes. Let me check, make sure we've, we're okay here. Oh, I think you need, I think you need more of the globe.
I've already lost one of my pieces of paper. Hang on. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we got a minute. So, you set up your little bucket of water, right? Get your uh, rags for your chalkboard just fine. Okay, perfectly calm out here. Then set some pages on a little uh, bench next to the upwind of the water bucket. Go inside, come back out, pages are in the water bucket. Blue into the water bucket. Crispy pages. That's life. Just dribbled down my front. God. Woo! I'm gonna wake myself up here. We got one minute. Let me think about what we're doing. I'll come up with something. Good morning, Madison, Wisconsin, and we will begin. Thank you for joining us this morning. Almost said this evening. Thank you for joining us this morning. My name is Nick, pretty sure. Well, good morning to you all. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to my backyard. I'm a geology teacher at the college in town. I've been doing these live streams for quite a few weeks now during this global pandemic. And we continue this morning with a discussion of mima mounds. So I've been coached up in the last few days. I've heard both Mima and Mima, Mima and Mima from various different people here in Washington. But I've been assured from the Olympia people and we're, uh, it lo we're going to a specific place to at least to start with this morning. Here's my backyard in Ellensburg, Washington. Here's Seattle, that's a two hour drive up and over the Cascades, that's Snoqualmie Pass. You know, we've talked about many of these things in this series. Here's the state capital of Olympia, and to the southwest of Olympia is a little nature preserve, a natural preserve, Mima Mounds something or other. It's not a state park, but it's land that's been set aside because of these unusual Mima Mounds. So my first point is that I'm saying Mima this morning, and if you've heard Mima, um, I'm not saying it's incorrect, but the locals here say Mima, so we're saying Mima, damn it. Okay, Mima Mounds. Now, I've got a couple of preamble comments for us this morning to set the stage for our discussion, and then we'll get right into it. The first comment is, uh, by now you know that I teach Geology 101 and have been every academic term for 30 years. And uh, so I have experience dealing with 19-year-old kids, and I have experience with them in the field. Uh, we live in such an amazing area here in Ellensburg that within our two-hour lab periods, they're literally just two hours long, they meet once a week, depending on the week, we have four field trips that we can cram into a two-hour window. Like we got the two vans outside the building, we say, good morning, here we go, jump in the vans, here we go, we drive 15 minutes, 10 minutes out to a field site, uh, we spend our hour plus out there, and then by the time we're back to campus, they're ready to hit their, their class two hours later, their next class in their schedule. So my point is, 
there's been a lot of work with 19 year olds from all parts of Washington that have no real interest in science, certainly not any interest in geology. And one of the main things we do on those field trips, whether it's up on Menashtash Ridge or down in the Yakima River Canyon or out towards Thorpe with the volcanic mud flows or at the base of Craig's Hill, doesn't matter what the topic is, our main uh, goal for those students is when we're in the field, we separate data from interpretation. That is crucial. And it doesn't come naturally to people. Like, we want to be real disciplined in our work when we're out there during that short little one hour field trip when we're actually at the site. And we say, okay, our first 15 minutes is nothing but observations. Just think like a second grader, just observe things with your eyes, write things down, you know, those some props and they've got to fill out a little chart or whatever, or they have to sketch a little outcrop of something. But the point is those first 10, 15 minutes of their hour when they're at the field site is dedicated solely to writing down, measuring, or breaking rocks open, carefully studying what's inside. And that is totally separate from the storytelling data observations, interpretation or ideas on what we can dream up creatively to explain the data. But we have to make sure that our ideas fit the data. And this is a theme you've heard. If you're, if you're regular with me, you've heard that regularly. I can't emphasize that enough. And so I mentioned this pretty carefully this morning because the fun part of this discussion will be coming up with ideas to explain these mounds. But we're not gonna start with the ideas, and that's my other part of this preamble. I won't do too much on this, but I feel like I wanna say it. When that 19-year-old jumps out of the van, and they're excited, and they, they're actually into it now. They're surprised, but it's like week four, and they're ready to go. And as soon as they're getting out of the van, they're surveying the scene, they're looking at a couple things, and in about 3.5 seconds, they go, oh, lava flow with a big flood that made this canyon. In other words, I don't know, maybe they're just screwing with me, but they jump right to the interpretation. And the fact that they actually vocalize it, we got our group of 20 students, and you know, they're kind of a loud mouth, and they're just going, oh yeah, yeah, this and this and this, and quite often they're not screwing with me, they're genuinely excited and they can see the story within less than a minute of being out there. And that's dangerous for this particular reason. They have attached themselves to their story. Like that's the first thing they did. Boom, lava flows and a flood. And then for the rest of the time we're out there, this guy, it's typically men do this, by the way. So this guy is like constantly like defensive now. Like if somebody's talking about something that's not a lava flow, he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. My idea was the lavas. And you graft on to this idea and you don't let go. I think that's human nature. And so suddenly the people, let's call him Tyler. Tyler's in this story now, suddenly. And Tyler's, you know, defending to the death his idea of the lava and the, and the flood. Even though we're all trying to just collect our data first and then trying to come up with as many different possible ideas. So I think you hear what I'm saying. Even in geology conferences or professional geology field trips, feels like people are putting themselves into it too much. And they're not really being objective because they've already kind of figured it out and they're blind to anything else. So I don't know, maybe you've already left a comment on, you know about the Mima Mounds and you have the answer and you've got your idea, so you've already kind of done what Tyler does when he's jumping out of the van. All I'm asking is that we have a scientific discussion and all I mean by that is that we separate our data from our interpretation, okay? And last thing to say, nobody knows the interpretation. People have been looking at these mounds for 150 years easily, and nobody's figured it out. So if you're, you know, if you're in the UK and you got your popcorn, a little bit of whatever, and you're ready to kind of wait and wait and wait, and then you get the, the payoff in the end, it's not coming.
Nobody's been convincing with the right kind of data or nobody's come up with the best explanation, the best interpretation to fit all of the data that we have. Okay, I got to say one more thing. I, I know you want to get rolling, but I got to say one more thing. It's common for those that don't, don't latch onto one eye, so the anti-Tylers, and they're weighing all these different ideas, and then when the field trip's done, it's common for geologists or whoever to say, well, you know, it's probably just a combination of factors. You know, the Earth is complicated, and it's probably a combination. And that always feels wrong to me. First of all, it just probably not an equal combination of tons of factors. There's got to be one driving factor to explain these things we're about to talk about. But the other part of it is back to the human nature part. You know, you watch a movie and it's a, it's a, it's a murder mystery and, and they start the movie with this, there's the dead body, there's the dead guy in, in the floor of the pantry. He's dead. And there's a big old hole in his chest, you know. It's obviously a bullet went into his chest. The guy's dead bullet hole in his chest. And then you're, you know, okay, well, I wonder if we can figure out who did it. Who's the killer? And you know, oh, what? Oh, oh, oh that, oh yeah, butler, uh-huh, yeah, the, the, the babysitter. And by the end of the movie, after all the evidence and all the, 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 the detective work has been done, what does the detective say? Look into the camera and go, well, it's a combination of things, you know. He did have, he ate a lot of potato chips and had a lot of stress at that uh, law firm. So kind of a combination of things that, that killed him. It's like, how about the hole in the, in the chest? How about the gun? So. Uh, 10 minutes of that. Wasn't planning on that. Here we go. Data, mama mounds, interpretation, bunch of ideas. Okay, let's say you're in Scotland, you're in Switzerland, you're in Japan, you're like, I have no idea what we're talking about. Well, here's what the mounds look like. And you're like, isn't that some sort of computer image? Yeah, it is. They really look like that? Yeah, they do. Here's a beautiful image from the Washington Geological Survey Beautiful LIDAR imagery and art, Daniel Coe. I've talked about him on past live streams. So this is a real image of a place called Thurston County. And it's a prairie. I mean, that looks like goosebumps on your arm, or that looks like the skin of a pigskin. I spent 20 minutes looking for a football this morning. I couldn't find it. Okay. So we're going here to the Mima Mounds, and we're really talking about these mounds that look like this. Let's keep going with data. I'm trying to keep all the ideas and the interpretations away for a while. Oh, you want a real photo from a drone? Okay, we can do that. So obviously people are interested. <laughs> like, what is the story? And for a few years, I've tried to get our producers of the PBS show to do a Mima Mound show, because people always ask about them. And they're like, I don't know, what, what could I, you know, all I have to show is this. Like the videographers, like, I, I need a variety of things. I need kind of, you know, grand scenery. And this, uh, what am I going to do? I'm going to show this for five minutes? And, uh, and when you go to the Mima Mounds area, the park, I'll just call it the park, they even have a little visitor center that's shaped like a Mima Mound. Isn't that cute? So you look at some kiosks in here. You can go up the staircase and kind of get up at least a little bit and see a number of these, uh, these mounds. We're still just getting introduced, especially if you've never been to these Mima Mounds. And I'm still, so far, just at this star, but we'll be going elsewhere in just a bit. These Mima Mounds are not just at that star. But here's in uh, Bates McGee's uh, wonderful old classic textbook, page 303. This is from 1970. And B 
Beautiful aerial shot before drones. So I guess this is from an airplane or something. Hot air balloon. Okay. That's our topic. That's what my mamans are. Uh, you're like, well, I don't live in Western Washington. Maybe the mounds that I have here are what this guy's talking about this morning. So we call them Mima Mounds here in the Pacific Northwest. In California, apparently they're commonly called hog wallows. Or maybe you've got prairie mounds or pimple mounds or silt mounds. As far as I can tell, those are all kind of the same topic this morning. So if you'd rather have this be a prairie mound talk, then by all means. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm hesitating because I want to make sure we don't mix up our data from our interpretation. Uh, has anybody dug into these mounds to look at their compositional makeup? Yes. And unfortunately, Charles Wilkes came through in the 1840s and he's like, I think these are burial mounds. Let's get them, let's cut them open, see what's inside. Like that's offensive on so many levels, but it was a different time. So... They weren't burial mounds. He dug into three, and since then, people have used ground-penetrating radar and other kinds of ways to look inside to excavate some of these mounds, and there's no evidence of humans. Um, they're not burial mounds. So he goes to the whiteboard just once, I think, this morning. And the sun will continue to move. I know I got this big shadow coming through here, but that, that'll move on us. Um, yeah, you can really see the shadow now. So here's my attempt to give you a feeling for the dimension of these things and a couple other pieces of data. Now, I think I need to say right off the bat that what I've got on the whiteboard is the best way to portray what the Mima mounds look like on Mima Prairie, southwest of Olympia. But I feel like I need to say, oh, you know what I'll do? If I can find it. Yeah. The Mima Mounds, or Pimple, or Prairie, or Hog Wallows, or whatever. Here's a map that might cool your jets a little bit, if you've got a, a favorite idea already, if you're a Tyler. Um, so here's a map of the U.S., the lower 48 states, and the areas that have these mounds. So this is still data, but in addition to Mima, eastern Washington, I mean, this is out in the channeled scablands, the Great Valley of California, San Diego area, and even the lower Mississippi Valley. Now, I'm from Wisconsin, we have burial mounds there. Truly burial mounds, truly archaeological. But, and I'm jumping to interpretation just a bit, but I, I, I shouldn't do that, sorry. So, so here's the areas that have been carefully mapped where we have these repetitive mounds. Okay, so I'm showing you the data from here and I've got some slightly different data from the channeled scablands of Eastern Washington, but I admit right now, I don't know much about how the mounds might be different in these other areas. And you might, if, if you're from those areas and you know quite a bit more about them, just data-wise, maybe you can contribute a little bit to us. Or, now that I think about it, if you are on other continents, and as we continue to kind of look at the data here, and you think you've got some mounds, that would be very fun, I think. Uh, for us to read about your mounds, if you feel like they've got the right dimensions and some of the other things I'm about to share. So this could be a fun benefit of a worldwide Q&A or a worldwide live chat situation where we can actually kind of learn from you because most of the literature I've found is, 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 is Western North America specific. Although I have heard that there are some mounds and uh, Argentina, like out on the Pampas, is that what you, how you call it? Pampas? Uh, and South Africa, apparently, but I, I, I don't know what I'm talking about now. 
So that'd be fun if you, if you have visited or you live in a place on another continent that has some of these. Okay, so back to this. Uh, I'm not going to be bothered by the, the shade. Uh, I, I am bothered, but I'm going to ignore it, and hopefully you can too. The shadow, I mean. So basically, here's more data for you that on the Mima Prairie, the mounds themselves... Uh, average about four feet high and 40 feet across. Now there's pretty wide variability here. And you're like, well, I, ours are five feet. Ours are three feet. Ours are 50 feet. Okay. All right. I got it. But I just picked a nice um, average number for height and width to give you a feeling. And the shape is quite usually about this shape. In Western Washington, there is almost always a kind of gravel and cobble substrate. So it's not bedrock. It's a bunch of, it's hundreds, it's tens of feet at least, maybe hundreds of feet of, of coarse gravel and river cobbles. Trying to stay away from interpretation. That's coming. But the mounds are not typically made out of those river cobbles or gravels. They're typically in Western Washington made out of fine sand or silt. And I'm going to show you a picture right now to show that these mounds have a very dark, when you cut one open, since we know they're not burial mounds, when you cut them open, there's a, a real dark black compared to the, the color here. So I couldn't show that on my whiteboard, but this is basically black versus light tan. Let's look at that right away before I forget. Here's another book to put in your library. I forget if I've already plugged this one, but Dave Tucker is a wonderful fellow. He's been in Bellingham most of his life. He's taught occasionally at the university, Western Washington University, but uh, uh, he's had a blog for years and um, does public field trips, public lectures, and uh, knows a lot about Western Washington in particular. And I, I know I did show you this before because I showed you what I think is an amazing uh, front back cover uh, illustration showing Rainier erupting and Lahars coming down. I think we should do a Lahars in Western Washington show. Just had that thought right now, but I think that might work. Um, so I mentioned D Dave's book because he's got a full chapter. I think he calls them vignettes, but he's got a chapter, vignette number six is Enigma on the Prairie, the Mima Mounds. And it's well done. Uh, uh, I, I was trying to cobble a bunch of stuff together last night on my own, and then I got to Dave's chapter. I'm like, oh God, it's all right here. This is great. So good job to you, Dave. Uh, Paul Kane who was a Canadian landscape painter. I think I talked about him briefly with St. Helens uh, back in the 1840s. Paul Kane was, was traveling through. He visited the Mima Mounds in 1847. Here's an interesting painting of the mounds. But what I really wanted to show you, and I'm skipping over some wonderful cartoons that Dave has about the ideas, the interpretations, which we'll get to in a second. Here, Stephen Slaughter, former student here at Central in this, po in this photo. So I like this photo for a number of reasons. I'm really hoping to get it in focus now. So here's Stephen, who's 6'2", and they didn't excavate this, or maybe they did, but there is this excavated Mima Mound that you can get to on the prairie. So you can see it's kind of jet black in the mound itself, and if I can push my luck here on focus, I really can't tell how I'm doing on focus. But there are some cobbles in amongst the fine sand and silt in the dark stuff, but then here's this kind of gravelly, cobbly substrate. But Dave, I don't know if you can read his text here, but Dave says, look out, look at these kind of 
what is he? You can read it better than I. I can't remember what he said. Four inches to a foot, maybe. It's like they're not roots, but they look like these kind of little wedges that are going down into the cobbly substrate. Is that a is that an important clue as to how these mounds at least get started? Okay. Uh, so I tried to show that just a little bit with my sketch because I was intrigued by that, and maybe you are too. So that's why I did these little guys kind of after the fact. So at least that one mound on the Mima Prairie has not a perfectly sharp boundary, but there's a little bit of these places where that kind of organic, rich, silty stuff is, is, is coming down. So in between the mounds, so there's another mound right over here, right? Another mound that you, you saw them spaced. Uh, it's just gravel. So silty mound, no silt, just gravel. And then next silty mound, next silty mound, etc. Well, guess who was visiting the Mima Mounds in 1911? J. Harlan Bretz. So, I mean, these, these live streams are turning into a, a love fest every time for either Tom Foster or J. Harlan Bretz or both. Uh, we will eventually get to a topic where we don't talk about Bretz, like tomorrow, I suppose. I guess. Maybe I'll even throw it in tomorrow. But uh, for those uh, that aren't aware, J. Harlan Bretz is a very important geology figure here, and he did most of his field work back in the 19-teens, the 1920s. I'm not sure I've shared this chronology with you, but Bretz grew up in Michigan, was a high school teacher in Michigan, uh, came out to Seattle to teach high school for a few years, and he was visiting the Mima Mounds with his high school students. He had a hiking club, kind of a Boy Scout group called the Peripatetics, and he took these boys, these high school boys, on weekend walks where they would literally go like 20 miles in a day. And uh, they're just walking all over the place. You know, you can't just jump in a car in 1908, for instance. And then he went on to greater fame at the University of Chicago. But um, from the, those four years, from those three or four years of high school teaching in Seattle, Bretz was compiling all this wonderful field data from the Puget Lowland. And when he went to the University of Chicago, his PhD dissertation was on the glacial deposits of Puget Lowland. I'm not saying the Mima Mounds are from glaciers, right? Just sharing where Bretz's observations come from. So this is a wonderful publication. If you can find it online, I think you can. Uh, there's a hard copy in our university library. 1913, J. Harlan Bretz, Glaciation of the Puget Sound Region. And even though this was his PhD dissertation, oh, Bijou's playing with the cozy fort. Hey, don't do that playing with our uh, black quilt. Oh, there he goes. Uh, so anyway, so here's a classic shot. Love this photo. Brett's took out his little brownie or whatever the camera was in 1911. And here's some of his high school students walking across the Mima Mounds on the Mima Prairie. They were just putting in roads at the time. So they're, they're putting a couple roads right through some of these Mima Mounds. Are you getting impatient? Come on now, we gotta be disciplined. Uh, you know that I'm a fan of Brett's for many reasons, including how he uh, uses good writing to describe his field observations. You know, lots of field data is just kind of boring, like stats and that sort of thing. But he had a flair for even describing his observations. So I'm gonna hunt through some of his text and share some of his observations of the Mima Mounds with you. The mounds occur on outwash. Well, the mounds occur on gravel. Mounds attain their best development on nearly plain gravel surfaces. So he says the landscape needs to be very flat to form the best mounds. Does that mean the, the gravel needs to be flat? The landscape needs to be flat to get the best mounds. Steeply sloping areas are commonly moundless. The mounds have a regularity of form that is remarkable. 
In the hundreds of acres of the mound prairies, there are but few exceptions to the general form of a spherical segment. Mounds in any one locality are nearly uniform in size. There are nowhere large mounds scattered in an area of small mounds. I mean, these are basic observations, but some of them you don't kind of think carefully enough to actually write down. At least I don't. There is almost invariably an accumulation of cobbles or pebbles on the surface among, no, sorry, uh, sorry. There's cobbles or pebbles on the surface uh, among the mounds, surrounding the mounds. I read that incorrectly. Here's a hand-drawn uh, view from the air. Brett's must have done with a India ink. He's finding some cobbles within the mounds themselves, but mostly the mounds are made of finer grain stuff. All prairies of the region bear a surficial black silt. In the mounds, the silt has accumulated to a thickness as great as the mound height, and in places greater, so that it forms a lens-shaped accumulation, while between the mounds, the silt is thin or not non-existent. The mounds are structureless, that's an important observation. There's no layering that you see inside of one of these Mima mounds. It's just a <laughs> batch of stuff. Okay, for those that are impatient, I'm about done with my observations. Just for fun, here's the, the geologic map of Puget Lowland from Brett's dissertation uh, from 1913. So he's mapping where the glacial the terminal moraine is, the outwash plains. So I, we're, we're, we're grading now into our interpretation topic and we are very close. Good morning. We are very close to the edge of the ice. So you want to lean a little bit towards the fun part? We're done with the boring part. We're into the fun part. And maybe you've now got your idea, your favorite idea. And I don't know, have you done it already? If you haven't done it already, and you've already done some thinking about these Mima mounds, what's your favorite idea? Do I want to do that? Yeah, why not? It's time to be Tyler, okay? You, you're different than Tyler already. You, you've, 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 you've gotten a bunch of different field data. Not only the, the distribution of these Mima mounds across the Western US, but, oh, I know, I'm sorry, I got one more piece of data. I'm sorry, one more piece of data. The work we've done in the last 50 years or so was trying to get a date on these mounds. What do we know? What data do we have about the, the age of the mounds? Can we find some carbon material, some organic material in the mounds? Can we get an age on some charcoal or some plant material or some volcanic ash? And Yes, the answer is yes. We've been able to get datable material in the mounds or on top of the mounds or below the mounds even. And the main message is there's lots of different dates, but they're all younger than 10,000 years. So these are mounds that are forming after the ice left. So because of that, because we have no Mima mounds where there's glacial till, or where we're definitely underneath an alpine or an, a continental glacier, we got to get rid of that. No mounds where we have glacial till. Now, the last piece of observation uh, comes one more time, Bruce Bjornstad, book two on the Trail of the Ice Age Floods, The Northern Reaches, page 83. Uh, it's best just to read this to you. One of the most visible and curious features of the channeled scab lands. So the channeled scab lands are in eastern Washington. We're not on the chalkboard now. We're out where the Missoula floods were happening. Um, are the regularly spaced hillocks called Mima Mounds. So there's thousands of Mima Mounds in eastern Washington and in eastern Oregon, I might add. But, but Bruce, is, uh, Bruce and Jean are talking about uh, eastern Washington. The circular, measle-like bumps range up to several tens of feet wide and several feet high, 
Within the channeled scab land of eastern Washington, they generally form where there is a thin cover of loose rubble and wind-blown silt. This is the loose silt now, the kitchen flower. Overlying, flat-lying, rocky basalt bedrock. Okay, let me put that on hold. So this is from a science paper on the mounds. And here's more data now. So we were looking that the whiteboard that I drew for you is here in western Washington. There's our mounds on top of a gravelly substrate. Bruce is now describing uh, Mima mounds in eastern Washington that are sitting directly on top of the German chocolate cake. There is no gravelly uh, substrate generally. And apparently in California, they've got kind of a clay hard pan beneath the Mima mounds. And I can't hold it. There are Mima mounds on top of Menashtash Ridge. I'm pointing to them right now. So there are beautiful Mima mounds up at Shanico, Oregon. That's a fam fa favorite place of mine. Or on top of Menashtash Ridge, where we're a thousand feet the valley floors, a thousand feet above the valley floors. And we are on, on steep slopes. And the mounds are not perfectly spherical, but they kind of have a lopsided look. And uh, on LIDAR, those mounds kind of look like teardrops coming down uh, a steep desert ridge. Okay, back to Bruce. I think it's really important to go through this, this factual information, these observations. Do you agree? I hope so. Because if, if we have our storytelling and our, our I think it's this, I think it's that, it's not based on anything except your emotions. We don't need that. We don't need your emotions this morning. The Mima Mounds in eastern Washington are composed mostly of silt. The mounds can also occur atop flood bars, underlined with thick piles of coarse gravel and sand. So there's kind of truly silt mounds. And by the way, up on Menashtash, they're mostly silt mounds. So therefore, the, the vegetation is different. There's, there's beautiful flowers and grasses on the silt mounds, but then surrounding it, there's kind of a rocky apron surrounding almost like it looks like somebody put some of them are like perfect like masonry bricks going around but it's totally natural so out in eastern washington we have silt mounds and then we also have mounds that occur atop flood bars underlain with thick piles of coarse gravel and sand i just said that however they are most abundant upon the flood swept basalt plateaus and coulees of the channeled scab lands in contrast, they are rarely observed in the loose covered Palouse Hills. No Mima mounds where we have the rolling hills of kitchen flour. In fact, these Mima mounds are best preserved in high energy flood swept areas, indicating that developed since the last Missoula floods around 15,000 years ago. Had the mounds developed before the last floods, they would have been wiped out by the flood erosion or severely molded and streamlined by flood water, which is definitely not the case. One more paragraph and then we're going to the ideas. I find this fascinating and I haven't seen this anywhere else. Recent investigations by archeologists discovered in, in a Native American campfire hearth beneath a Mima mound in the vicinity of Eskier Ranch. Several radiocarbon dates of the hearth indicate that it was used as recently as 500 years ago. The oldest radiocarbon date is 1,710 years ago. Because the mounds lie above the campfire hearth, the mound has to be younger than the campfire hearth and thus suggest that some Mima mounds may only be a few hundred years old. If this is the case, wind, one of the few active geologic processes still affecting the scab lands, may play a major role in development of Mima mounds via trapping wind-blown silt, like the Luss on top of the St. Helens Ash we did on our field trip on Thursday night. Trapping of wind-blown silt, Luss, by vegetation. Mounds may initiate as loose, okay, we're into an interpretation now. Okay, so there's dates ranging from 10,000 years old for the mounds down to apparently possibly just a few hundred years old. Okay, so it's 938.
it's almost like I'm strategically stalling so we don't have to do question and answer. Because I got to say, I'm going to give you all I got. I, I, don't, I don't know if I can answer any questions. We'll try it. But I mean, you're going to be asking a bunch of stuff. I'm like, oh, sounds like a good idea. Don't know. Don't know. Don't know. So we're finally to the part that you've probably been waiting for. I haven't been stalling. So let's do this in dramatic fashion. First of all, let's find the sheet. All right. So I wrote out, I mean, there's, there's truly dozens of different ideas for why the Mima found, mounds exist. And if you're a combination of many different ideas, that's fine. But you know, I, I, wanna look, I want the gun. I want, I want, I want the gun. So originally the thought was burial mounds, and then we dug into some of the burial mounds. I've already commented on that. No evidence of human burials, okay? Are these mounds a de depositional story where you have something growing and the things that are growing are just kind of naturally spaced apart from each other. And then when you have a bunch of loose or windblown stuff, or I guess you can bring stuff in by water, uh, does, the, does that vegetation, whether they're grasses or trees even, do they act as an anchor then to allow all this stuff to kind of pile up in this conical form surrounding the vegetation? Which reminds me, I got to go back to Brett's. So the publication is 1913. So Bretz is talking to a farmer who has farmed at the Mima Prairie his whole life. One far this is Bretz writing. One farmer who lived on Mima Prairie for many, many years is convinced that the mounds which bear clumps of the stunted oak common to the gravelly soil are increasing in height. The farmer stated that in leveling the mounds for a roadway, the horses plunged knee deep repeatedly in the gravel and silt after the sodded surface of the mounds had been broken. Inferring from this that the mounds are hollow and they're hollow because there used to be tree roots that has since decayed. So the farmer using some logic thought that every mound was where there used to be a big oak tree and the tree is gone and the root ball has, has, has decayed away, and so the mounds are hollow. We know now that they're not hollow. But the idea that, that we're, we're concentrating these silty mounds, especially in places that we have vegetation kind of anchoring things and not letting the wind uh, have that stuff get blown away, so that's an approach to say that the mounds are depositional, anchored by the vegetation. Kind of similar to that, but different, uh, the thought is maybe the mounds, where we have all the mounds, so sediment trap, the idea is, is it possible that every one of the mounds used to be the opposite? Like originally, where we have mounds, we had depressions, like wet little sinkhole type things, but they were wet. And so sediment coming into the area were kind of naturally being uh, filled by the sediment. And then once we start those, those depressions get filled with sediment, then the sediment just gets piled higher and higher. It's a preferential place to drop sediment. So it's kind of a weird thing where the mounds were originally the places where we had depressions, sediment traps in other words. I got a few more. Have we got to your favorite yet? Frost polygons. So, you know, it's, it's interesting to read these papers because each new generation of geologists, you know, you got a bit young gun ho people is like, oh, they haven't figured it out. I'll go out and figure it out. This can't be that hard. And, and through the years, then there's kind of pet kind of, it's almost like fashion, you know, there's a certain kind of idea out there that's everybody's talking about. And back in the 50s and 60s, it was 
freeze and thaw, what we call paraglacial, meaning we're close to a glacier. We're not under the ice, but we're next door to where a big glacier was, and we have some sort of uh, repetitive freezing and thawing, like cracks in the permafrost up in the Arctic, for instance, and that this is just kind of forming mounds because we keep doing this cracking and, and freezing and thawing and freezing and thawing. Uh, a proponent of that, at least early on, was Marty Katz, who was my neighbor for a long time. Uh, Marty was a longtime uh, geography professor here at Central, started in 1952, and was still actively uh, going to his office and participating in talks and going to many of our talks uh, well into his 90s. So truly my next door neighbor, right, right behind the shed. And if you're looking to read about Marty's work, Martin Katz, K-A-A-T-Z, K-A-A-T-Z, Martin. Uh, he called them Menashtash mounds. So he was focused primarily on our Mima mounds that were not in Western Washington, but just to the south of Ellensburg. And if you zoom around on, on Google Maps or Google Earth, especially uh, Menashtash, just north of Umtanum Creek, you'll find these amazing Mima Mounds. And I don't think I have enough time. I was thinking about doing it, zooming around on Google Maps with you. But go to Shanico. Shanico's the classic little kind of ghost towny kind of a place in eastern Oregon. It's right on US 97. If you know the drive, US 97 between Biggs Junction and uh, Madras, you know Shanico, and I don't know how many times I've been on field trips with my students, and they're, oh, next time we stop for a restroom, they're like, what were all those mounds back there by Shanico? It's like, well, those are the Mima mounds. So you can go there and just see all these amazing, amazing mounds that, again, have these vegetation differences. What was I doing? Oh, yeah, frost polygon. So we're back to Dave Tucker's book, which is a really excellent source for this discussion, including a couple of uh, homemade illustrations that he made that I think are wonderful. So he's saying, if you go up to the Arctic, you see these cracks. I'm really blind here right now. I can't tell you about the focus, so we'll hope for the best. So in a paraglacial setting, you're constantly cracking, freezing, thawing, freezing, thawing, and getting those patterns. And so the frost polygons idea to explain the mounds is that you do enough of this freezing and thawing to develop sediment that's separated from its neighbor. And then a picture is worth a thousand words, so you can kind of see eventually you melt the frost you get the polygon set up, and the Mima mounds are a result. Now, are we doing that in Louisiana? I don't know. Maybe we are. That's always the discussion, right? You, you, you kind of hear an idea, and then you go, okay, but how about San Diego? Oh, okay. Well, how about Olympia? Oh, okay. How about... Let's keep going. We do want to get to the Q&A, even though uh, I'm, I'm kind of half afraid of it this morning. How many more I got on my list? I got three more on my list. So far, we got these. And you're gonna be pissed if your idea isn't on the list, but oh well. A little early to be pissed, isn't it? Oh, what? Never heard of that one, you say? Sun cups, who came up with that? Brett's. Again, Dave Tucker's book. Another homemade, Dave talked about how much time he spent with his computer trying to figure out how to make all his anime, all of his uh, uh, illustrations. Time well spent, Dave. Here's Brett's idea, although Brett's wasn't totally in love with it, but uh, it was a novel idea. The sun cup idea for Mima Mounds. You have some snow or ice, I guess. You melt the top of the snow or ice. You naturally form these cups. Somehow there's a bunch of sediment. I guess it's lust that gets blown into the cups. The snow or ice melts and you're left with the mounds. 
it's kind of similar to the sediment trap idea that you're actually trapping sediment when you have a, a divot and then where the divot was is now an actual mound. Hope that makes some sense to you. I, uh, before we leave Brett's and the idea of snow and ice, I need another waterlogged piece of paper here. So from Brett's work primarily, here's just the location. I'm, I'm right into the sun now, so I can't even, I can only see like a reflection off the phone. So I, I really am kind of blind at the moment. Hopefully this is working for you. Um, so here are the Mima mounds in the red circle. Here's the maximum extent of the continental glacier over Seattle. It got down to Tenino and places like that. There was a glacial lake, carbon apparently, I don't know anything about it. There was some draining of the glacial lake, kind of a smaller version of the Missoula floods, but just water draining out the Chehalis to the Pacific Ocean. And so those gravels are for sure, at least on the Mima Mound area, the Mima prairies and the other prairies of this area the gravels are definitely uh, glacial outwash. And we got the mounds not where the ice was, but next door to where the ice was. We can go back and forth on each of these ideas. I mean, there's no, there was never any glaciers on top of uh, Monashtash Ridge or Shanico. There was never any ice right next door to many of the Mima mounds in Eastern Washington. You can start hopefully seeing why we don't have an answer. We don't have a winner. We got two more on the list. I want to tell you my favorite, but I guess I'm not going to. Wait for it. Wait for it. Oh. Now, you know, I'm a geologist. I don't know anything about biology. That's my wife's game. But you talk to a lot of biologists. And it's an open and shut case. Obviously, these are pocket gophers. I'm like, really? Oh, yeah. And one of the maps that I found last night, shows the distribution of the Mima mounds and the range of different species, if you call it that, of pocket gophers. This is another one that got soaked in the water bucket, but hopefully you can read it. I don't have a source for this, sorry. I was just, I was just Googling like crazy last night, going to YouTube, finding all sorts of Mima Mound videos. So there's a relationship here between the dark areas, I don't know, can you even see them? So the dark areas are the Mima Mound areas, and then all these colors are different kinds of pocket gophers. And the idea that these gophers make this mound to the fact that they're all trying to, I think, they're digging up wet soil and trying to get some dry soil. So they're all, all the mounds are where you kick the soil out of the wet muck and you create these nice kind of fluffy mounds to then live in, or I, I, I don't know anything about biology. But it's not a joke. There's many biologists, plenty of geologists, who say this is a pocket gopher story. All right, last one on my list, maybe not on yours. We continue to learn more and more about earthquakes in Western North America. We've made tremendous leap forward in discovering earthquake faults and getting a sense of the magnitudes of prehistoric earthquakes. And the basic message is with each decade, we have more and more sobering news 
about earthquake activity in Western North America. Is it possible that you take a bunch of sediment and you shake the crust? And you shake the crust and you shake the crust and you shake the crust. And is it possible for that sediment to naturally dance into these mounds? Does that sound crazy to you? Are there really earthquakes in the Mississippi Valley? Actually, there are. Are there really earthquakes in California? Actually, there are. Are there really earthquakes in the Pacific? Actually, there are. So that's what this paper is all about. Formation of Mima Mounds, a seismic hypothesis. This came out in 1990. So you know how this works. If you want clicks on uh, YouTube or whatever, or on the internet in general, you, you title your, your little thing, uh, Mima Mound uh, Mystery Solved, you know? And there's tons of those little traps, you know? And then you click on it and it's like, what? They don't, huh? So there's a lot of that sort of thing. Okay, Bijou is hungry, wants to get inside. We're going to the Cozy Fort. I got a few things for you, and then we'll go to your Q&A. Come on, Bijou, let's go. Come on. And that reminds me of Vinman's Bakery and a t-shirt for me and a t-shirt for Liz uh, uh, were, were left outside the house last night from Jeff from Vinman's Bakery. So thank you for the gift, Jeff. Didn't drop off Danishes, but dropped off a Vinman's Bakery t-shirt, 2XL fits and um there is uh, i hope jeff is watching this morning and i jeff i hope you can add uh, a link to how to support I'll, I'll show people with the laptop but i couldn't find an obvious link so i'll give you more about uh the t-shirts and how you'd be supporting a good cause in this town beyond just uh venman's bakery but uh, before we do that let's go to some other clips involving uh mima mounds Cozy Fort. I think half of these shows are getting longer just because I'm less, or I'm, I'm more willing to just take, val take your valuable time by doing stuff like this. But your comments are are so kind and it doesn't seem like you're bothered by a bunch of this stuff. You know, nobody's saying these are way too long. And uh, I enjoy making them, so I guess we'll do what we want. Ooh! Vinman's Baker, you gotta love it. Cozy Fort, you gotta love it. All right. So I'd never really just kind of gone to YouTube and searched for Mima Mounds. I had no idea there'd be so many, and most of them were not that impressive, to be honest with you. Uh, that's my point of view. But I did find a few that I liked and I thought were a valuable contribution to what we're doing. We'll start with San Diego, California. Two minutes. Some say these were created by earthquakes. Others say aliens made them. Now a researcher says he's discovered the secret behind one of the country's biggest geological mysteries that can be seen right here in San Diego County. 10 News reporter Michael Chen reveals the creature believed to be behind the creations and the San Diego study that led to the conclusion. 
from Puget Sound to San Diego, the sight of them is strange and unexplained. Dirt mounds known as Mima Mounds, rising as high as 8 feet tall and 30 feet wide. The mound I'm standing on top of is about 3 feet tall. For thousands of years, Mima Mounds used to stretch across the mesas of San Diego County, including much of Kearney Mesa and Otay Mesa. Theories for the mounds range from earthquakes to floods to aliens. I would definitely say it's an enduring mystery. A mystery one San Jose researcher believes he has solved. Geologist Pat Abbott is not that researcher, but he brought us to some Mima mounds in the Miramar area. Almost all of the local mounds at nearby vernal pools have disappeared because of development. Here we see some of the burrows. Could these burrows be home to the true architect of the mounds, the pocket gopher? The gopher theory is based on the work of former SDSU professor George Cox, who studied gophers living under local mounds and used colored pellets to track dirt movement. He found that gophers moved dirt uphill when the ground underneath got wet. And over, you know, decades and centuries, that gradually builds the mound. Using Cox's research and computer modeling, the San Jose researcher showed the creation of the mounds over a thousand year period. But that doesn't tell you, did they build the mound to begin with? Or did they simply occupy a mound and then modify it? Other scientists have questioned whether a simulation is definitive proof. Cox says it is the best explanation for a site that has for so long been heaped in mystery. Michael Chen, 10 years. Well, some scientists, including Adam, believe there are multiple causes for Mima Mounds. Other multiple causes, there you go. That wasn't as loud as it could. I just hit the volume. Sorry about that. The, the others will be louder. Uh, this is a nice little um, one minute or so of drone work done just last November um, that I enjoyed. There's that visitor center, that little white thing. That's a nice shot. I could have used more of that shot personally. All right, a couple more for you. By the way, I've heard from a lot of you about how I can improve my professionalism with the, the audio visual and I can go on to some, thank you, but um, Kind of half the fun is just doing a cozy fort like this. So I know it's not perfect, but I prefer that kind of approach. So I know that there's other ways to do this, but I choose to do it this way. Hope you understand. All right, now this is, let me read the description. Sound monolith resonance patterns water from Andrew Roberts. So this is, we're into physics and math now but this is basically analogous to shaking a substrate, basically thinking about earthquakes now. And if we have a kind of a, remember the electronic electric football, are you old enough to remember? Plastic guys and put the little felt football in, under their arm and then turn the, uh, I should get one of those. I should find electric football set from 1968, boy, we, played that for hours but that's kind of this vibrating table and having all these most players would dance around and then fall that would be totally great why didn't i think about that earlier all right anyway this is not electric football but this is something different I have no idea what I'm looking at. All 
uh, I forget if I bookmarked it, but there's a video that Scott Burns was involved with. Scott Burns is an excellent geologist down in Portland, and he's done a fair amount on uh, different mediums. Oh, I didn't bookmark it. So you can also get the effect by having a kind of plywood with a bunch of sand on it, and then you tap, hit it with a hammer. I thought about trying something like that. I ran out of time, but you get the same kind of dancing of the sand into those mounds that are regularly spaced apart from each other. Uh, yeah, I think that's... Okay, so this is a plug to go along with my t-shirt here from Vinman's Bakery. I don't know if this is happening nationwide, but at least here in Ellensburg, there is uh, a t-shirt shop called Shirtworks, run by Dan Rosso, who used to be a neighbor. And he, oh, can you see this? So he's basically selling t-shirts for $20 each, and $10 of each of the t-shirts goes to support local businesses here in Ellensburg. So I know you mostly don't live in Ellensburg, so maybe you're not interested, but if you wanted to get a Vinman's t-shirt, it's here. So that's what I'm modeling, and, and uh, Liz's fits well as well. Uh, comes in evergreen and maybe comes in evergreen, okay. But maybe there are similar, this is called Here for Good. And so half the proceeds go to keeping our local business here in Ellensburg afloat. And I, I have to assume that there's similar things like this going on in many communities around the world. But maybe Jeff Clindworth uh, in the comments has a, a way to get you to this site. Because I tried to just Google here, from, here for good and it went someplace else. Even Googling here for good Ellensburg, I still didn't get to this page, Jeff. So anyway, that'd be a way for you to uh, contribute locally here. Or if not here, then of course, any place else. That's the end of what I had planned for you this morning. Hope it was somewhere close to what you wanted to do. And at least got you curious about these mounds if you're unaware of them to this point. It's time for some q and I'll try my best. It's already ten, six minutes after 10, so I'm thinking 10 minutes or so of this. Let's find you here. And I certainly won't have answers for you, but I'll at least try to respond to some of your thoughts. Do mounds continue into the adjacent forest? Thank you, Todd. I think they do. There's LIDAR now. You know, there's this ability to basically remove trees digitally and see these uh, surfaces continuing beneath all the vegetation, the subdivisions and everything else. Um, I, I possibly even Dan Coe's imagery, the one that looked like details of a football skin, perhaps that's already removing a bunch of the trees. You mentioned permafrost. As the per permafrost melts, are Mima Mound structures apparent? Oh, like up if you go to the Arctic, Bill, and you actually study the permafrost, are you seeing Mima Mound structures like that? Good question. I don't know. I don't know. Any examples of boulders eroding into rubble piles faster than granite boulders? Boulders eroding into rubble piles. Well, you, it is true that you can have something like a big coarse-grained granite, like, say, in the Sierra Nevada mountains, like I used to teach that field course down in the Owens Valley of California for 20 years with our central students. And one of our mapping exercises was these beautiful granite boulders that were round, and it looked like they had been moved, but they were truly just granite held in place. And then because the crystals were so big, they, they were weathering out, and you just had this what we call grus, G-R-U-S, just this coarse grain junk laying at the bottom. So that is a thing, but I don't see how it relates here. Because there's no boulders anywhere. And all the, all the mounds truly just completely disintegrated boulders. Patrick, age six, are the mounds something that formed and now they're here? 
or are they still growing and changing? Are there areas geologists are studying where they're changing? Patrick, you always have good questions. Um, especially the silt mounds out in eastern Washington, where there's loose being blown around even to this day. If you were with us, Patrick, in our last live stream, we walked up to the top of the hill past the teenagers, and we found a thin layer of Mount St. Helens ash with 12 inches of loose on top of 1980. And so clearly the loose is still being blown around, so that I think, assume, we, we can... We can deduct from that, Patrick, that possibly the Mima Mounds, at least in eastern Washington, are still receiving silt. But this is still happening slowly enough that there's no way to track their movement, to my knowledge. How did the mounds form? Was it caused by water or something else? Water would have wiped out the mounds. What caused the mounds to form? And have they been shrinking over the years? Oh, this is from Daniel age 12. Um, well, I tried to give different ideas of how the mounds form, Daniel, and nobody knows the answer. Um, maybe you like certain ideas better than others. Um, I think many of the ideas are either based around the mounds are from sediment piling up, or the mounds are the only things that are left, and everything between the mounds has been taken away by water. And then we get into this physics of dancing sand, etc. Is the sub... Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Oh, God. Is the substrate similar on Menashtesh Mounds? Outwash. There's no glacial outwash on Menashtesh Ridge. It's similar to eastern Washington, where there's exposed basalt bedrock and a little bit, and basically loss. So it's identical, now that I think about it. So there were never any Ice Age floods on top of Menashtash Ridge. There were never any glaciers on top of Menashtash Ridge. No evidence for either of those. So basalt bedrock, silt that got blown in on the winds, and yet those mounds are all over the place, and again, kind of, Instead of our, our normal mounds that are just kind of equally spaced, many of those slopes on the, especially the south face of Menashtash, uh, if you look at LIDAR imagery of Menashtash, or even just Google Maps, if you get the right view, you can see those mounds just, it's amazing how they look like teardrops going down these ridges towards Umtanum Creek. I don't understand them. Evelyn, age seven. Are the mounds always in open areas where the wind could swirl from lots of directions? Generally, yes, Evelyn. That Mima Prairie is an open prairie. Um, but I think the mounds continue into the forest. I guess I'm not sure of that. So maybe you do need an open area. Excellent question. Convergent geology, different places, different causes, similar appearance. I guess Jack is saying combination of factors. But, this, but the, the appearance is similar. The dimensions I showed you. I mean, do you have mounds in your area? Do they have these kinds of dimensions? And are they regularly spaced? Again, I'm going to be very anxious to read the comments to see if I can learn about some new places on other continents and to see if this is truly a global phenomenon. It must be. But is it tied to latitude? Is it tied is it a lot, you know, is it weather, climate, all sorts of things. Is there evidence that the mounds were pushed up from below through those roots like a sand boil? No evidence that they have moved up or down or laterally based on the evidence that I shared with you. Still need mineral composition of dark stuff inside mound. I'm sure that's been done, Colin, a mineral analysis of the dark stuff inside the mounds on the west side. Now remember, they're not dark mounds over here in eastern Washington. It's kind of the lighter tan kitchen flower like in the Palouse. 
But over there in Western Washington, um, I guess I didn't read carefully enough, but I'm sure if you look into it, you'll find a detailed chemical analysis of the minerals in the dark stuff. Low frequency seismic events causing silt to rise to the surface through liquefaction. So Peter's wondering about the earthquake story and are we causing the silt to rise to the surface as we li liquefy the sediments? That is a process with seismic shaking. You, you, you take certain areas that are kind of wet sediment and you, you have it move kind of as a slurry, although I don't know, I should stop talking. I don't really know much about liquefaction. I think that's the idea though, Peter. And even though it's dry, it's, it's, of course, it's much drier here in eastern Washington. Do we really have earthquakes in eastern Washington? Yes. Do we really have magnitudes and regional earthquakes big enough to have the silt be dancing out by Spokane? Uh, in the Cheney Palouse track? Up at Shanico? I think it's possible. What's my favorite hypothesis? I'm a geologist. I like the earthquake idea. Um but you know that I'm not an expert in this and I've learned just as much as you have. I mean, I've been on some field trips and Carl Lilquist is a former student of Marty Katz. And so there's, I've learned a lot about the mime amounts from Carl and Marty. Um, but beyond that, I'm, I'm approaching this pretty much just like many of you are. Cretaceous Sea earthquakes, Cretaceous Sea too old, uh, Susan. Uh, earthquakes, I like the idea of the earthquakes. Frost mounds, question mark, says Nikki. Well, that's one of the ideas, that these mounds are from cracking and moving things laterally because of the freezing and thawing, especially if you're next door to a glacier. But remember, our newest techniques have given us ages that are far younger than when the ice was actually here. And I think to Marty, I'm pointing now to Marty's house. Marty passed away 10 years ago, maybe. Um, excellent scientist. To his credit, I think he published more than once on the, on the Menashtash mounds, and he changed his tune about the freezing and thawing because of the new dates that we had, saying that many of the mounds were 7,000 years old, 5,000 years old, and according to Bruce's book, uh, maybe even less than 1,000 years old. So he got away from the freezing and thawing just because we've had warmer climate lately, meaning the last few centuries or millennia. Uh, are sun cups kind of the opposite of kettles? Let's see, kettles are commonly thought about where you have a glacier, a big ice sheet, and, you, and then the glacier's melting back and you strand a big block of ice in the glacial till and then when the iceberg finally melts, you're left with a kettle or an actual kettle lake. Yeah, in that sense, I guess they are opposite. Because you're, you're, you're collecting sediment in a depression as opposed to making a depression because the ice was there. Mark says, Mel Waters made holes in mounds. Thank you, Mark. Are there Mima mounds in Idaho at Craters of the Moon? Fell for it. How does the composition differ from region to region? Uh, I don't know, Susan. In Washington, I can say that there's coarser material in western Washington and darker soils, if you want to call it that. Eastern Washington, they're mostly silt mounds with, again, a Menashtash. I, I wish I was trying to find a picture I couldn't from one of our field trips, but there's these big rocks. I don't know, cobble-sized rocks, but they're angular. And they're, they make these beautiful borders. <laughs> you look at it, you go, my God, who, who put these rock borders around? But there's so many of those rock borders around so many of those mounds, it can't be people. Or it doesn't seem likely that it's people. Um, but comparing that to California's Mima Mounds or Louisiana or, or uh, some of those other places, I don't, I don't know. Lorraine, thank you for the question. I, I don't have the mineralogy of the black silt. So many of you are asking about the composition of the mounds. I, I, I maybe should have tried to read more on that. 
Gophers, are there any skeletal remains, any evidence of gophers? Not to my knowledge. Uh, I don't know about burrows and skeletons and poop and other stuff uh, that associate with the typical gopher community. But as I understand it, that's the main argument against gophers. There's not physical evidence of gophers living inside of the mounds, to my knowledge. But to be honest, you know, there's full, you know, 60 page reports on gophers making the Mima mounds and I lose interest after, you know, I can't stay awake reading that stuff. Arctic mounds are called pingos. Thank you, Brian. Could ants or termites build these mounds? Can't rule anything out, but why would they be so equally spaced? Would permafrost have developed as far south as Louisiana? Right, that's the, each of these arguments has problems. That's why we don't have the answer. And it's quite difficult to visualize permafrost, especially mounds being formed, let's say less than 5,000 years old. Why would you have permafrost in Louisiana? Dale, Cornerstone Pizza. Are there layers of volcanic ash found in any mounds? Not to my knowledge, Michael, that would help, wouldn't it? That would give us some age horizons. But remember, at least from the Mima Mounds in Western Washington, Brett says there's no stratification. There's no layering. There's no Grand Canyon-like, here's the story of how first we had silt and then it changed to sand and then, none of that. It's just a, a batch. It's, it's almost like you, I'm not saying this is what happened, it's, oh, you know what? <laughs> I was gonna say, it's almost like you take a wheelbarrow and you just dump a bunch of stuff in your wheelbarrow and there's no layering, which reminds me, I gotta show this to you now. Have you seen this cartoon? Again, Dave Tucker, D. Molinar, I've been meaning to read more about, I guess it's him, I don't even know if it's a him or a her. But this is a famous cartoon. It's almost like the gophers did that. A cartoon by famed cartographer D. Molinar illustrating how gophers may have constructed the Mima Mounds. Ha ha. Couple more and we'll quit. Are there mounds on any other planets or on the moon? Not to my knowledge, German chocolate cake. Were they formed as mounds or were they once a continent? Yeah, right, so don't know about Warhawk. People are arguing both ways. It was a con like, do you have, in case I wasn't clear, in case I wasn't clear, you can have a bunch of people talking about nothing was here and then these hills got developed by dropping sediment, or it was a continuous layer of this silt, let's call it, and then it was removed in many places by water or wind. And then I guess if you're an earthquake person, you want the silt maybe half as thick as a continuous mantle, and then we, earthquake, maybe many, many earthquakes over the course of thousands of years and you have the sediment dance and coalesce to make the individual hills. Why no trees? Good question. So most of your questions are about the composition of the black stuff. And that's an interesting thing to me and I don't think I can easily just find a description I'm sure I can't in just a few minutes. Mike says, Native Americans were mound builders, but probably never on this scale, but you might as well add them to the list. Well, first of all, Mike, um, we can't be digging into things that are, are potential burial mounds today for absolutely incredibly um, sensitive and important reasons. Uh, where I'm from in Southern Wisconsin, the burial mounds are actually shaped like animals or other creatures that are major parts of their story. Astalon State Park near Fort, I'm from Fort Atkinson. 
the, the mounds, it's called the Mounds Country Club. They're, they built a golf course on a burial mound. As I, as I, I learn, meet more and more Native Americans, I get more and more upset thinking about this incredible, well, whatever. What, so, okay, if you, if you want to put burial mounds on the list, but there's, there's no evidence of any human, well. Last one, what do we got? Do the, John, do the mounds shrink and grow in relation to different seasons? It'd be nice to know that. There's no evidence of that. And we've had many students and professors and state scientists, et cetera, visit these mounds at different times of the year. And you would think that if there was some sort of seasonal change, that would have been noticed by now. Okay, I think that's, that's most of them. And I will be curious to, to look at the mineral composition of the black stuff in the mounds, but I don't have it for you right now. A toast to you. And you're welcome to join us again tomorrow morning, talking about earthquakes and deposits in Puget Sound, indicating tsunami. Uh, with some new field data that I've been able to learn from some es experts that are friends of mine. So I got more homework to do for tomorrow, but um, it's breaking news. Uh, involving tsunami deposits in Puget Sound, which I'm excited to share with you. Here's to Vinman's Bakery, located in downtown Ellensburg, Washington. You gotta love it. Here's to you, dear viewer, and your health, your physical health, your mental health, your connectivity with your friends, neighbors. Hopefully you have some sort of community that gives you strength. Here's to you. I appreciate you joining us tonight. I appreciate you joining us this morning. Hope that you have a pleasant Saturday. And for those that are watching in other time zones, good night from Ellensburg, Washington, USA. I love you. Goodbye. <laughs>